Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about neurobotics, which is a relatively new field of science that combines neuroscience with robotics. My guest is Yoki Matsuoka. She's a leader in the field, and she was founder and director of the Neurobotics Laboratory at the University of Washington. She's currently vice president of technology at a company called Nest. Her long-term research interest is prosthetic limbs controlled directly by the human brain. Yoki has won numerous awards, including a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers given by the President of the United States. She also has her own nonprofit foundation called Yoki Works, whose mission is to develop ingenious engineering solutions that allow people to overcome their physical or sensory limitations. Yoki has been profiled on PBS's NOVA and has a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. Born in Japan, she once aspired to be a champion tennis player. A series of injuries ended her tennis career, but got her thinking deeply about the mind-body connection which eventually led to her career in science. Yoki, welcome to the program. Good thanks. to have you today. Yeah, thanks, Marty. I'm delighted to be here. So tell me, how did an aspiring tennis player become a scientist? How did that connection work? Well, um, when, when I was trying to be a tennis player and my career started to sort of dwindle in college, I needed to think about something else to do with my life. And when I started to think, I was starting to combine, well, something else I'm good at, which is math and science, see what I could do. And what I decided that I really wanted to do was to build a tennis buddy for myself, which is made of robots with real artificial muscles and then the robotic legs that run around on a tennis court and then have buttons on the body that actually has, you know, how fast the speed of the ball is that day. And actually on the day that I really wanted to win, maybe it would just make it competitive, but just a little bit weaker than me. And on the days that I, you know, I, maybe I'm just tired or I'm mentally beat, maybe uh, I could actually turn it way down and just beat the heck out of it. Did you ever so, work on this robot or did it stay on the drawing pad? Actually, I went a little bit further than just thinking about it. So I helped a uh, graduate student at UC Berkeley build uh, robotic legs. Then I even went on to graduate school at MIT to build a uh, upper torso of a humanoid robot. In fact, I think we have uh, a slide showing uh, one of the robots you worked on. Can we see that slide, please? That first slide? OK, so what are we looking at here? <laughs> this is actually uh, what I've worked on at MIT. The guy on the left is Rodney Brooks. Uh, he was my PhD, uh, master's and PhD advisor who led this project. And then this robot to the right is called COG, C-O-G, uh, stands for cognition. Uh, our goal was to really build a robot that has a two-year-old level cognition and just physical and all the ability. That's pretty smart for a robot. It's amazing. Actually, you know, building a two-year-old spending five years of graduate student's time was really the goal. And, you know, sort of really trying to lead up to the tennis buddy, I was in charge of the limbs. And I started working on the hand at that point. And what I did for the hand for this robot was that I um, first built a mechanism and then hardwire the reflexes. So reflexes are those things like if the, the surface is hot and you touch it and then just let go, those are reflexes. And then babies are born with those things. So I hardwired it and then the rest was all learning, again, just like a baby. Well, I think we have a slide that shows something about those reflexes. There it is right now. Ah, well, yeah, so this one actually shows you how the brain um, so brain is a nervous system and then it actually has tails coming out of it which goes into the spinal cord and then comes out through your arms and then goes to your muscles and eventually goes to your um, arms and hands and then that makes the motion possible. So that, yeah, uh, but this, that, that slide was just showing mm -hmm. that, you know, as we think about moving the hands, we naturally make motion and it's interesting to start to think how can the, you know, the robotics or artificial intelligence really capture those motions. So you want to mimic the human body. The human body is the model and you want to replicate it pretty much. Yeah. In fact, we have another slide which I think shows some of the motion capture. Can we see that third slide, please? So this is a little bit dark, but I think what's going on is that there's some kind of tracking happening. Yeah. So, you know, if you notice that 
most of the robotic device, or even if you imagine how robots move, often they move in a clunky way, right? To the point that when we say, when somebody says walk like a robot, mm -hmm. we do this. Uh, 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 you uh, think thing, those right? old science fiction just, movies from the 1950s? Right, right, and it, it's that's because the robot gets their reputation. It doesn't make human-like motion, mm -hmm. but what we actually have to do is to capture motion like this and then really try to understand how humans make smooth motion and even come up with a mathematical formula for it. So and that, then So that slide was tracking human motions and then right. when you capture that you know what the robot has to do. Yeah, that's right. So if we could keep track of the brain signals and the motion, then if you try to understand a relationship between them, then we're onto something. Now, you eventually at the University of Washington developed some fairly sophisticated devices, uh, something that looks like a prosthetic arm. In fact, there it is right now. Uh -huh. So that, I guess, is your creation, yeah. more or less. So, so, you know, to the point, my, my passion of, um, you know, just building Tennis Buddy has sort of started to really become uh, obsessive in a way that I needed to understand every detail of what really makes the human elegant motion possible, what learning where the you know, learning really happens, where's the secret sauce? Why isn't that, you know, we've spent a good 50 years to build developing robots, but why aren't robots out there making those motions possible? So we, we even started from bones and tendons and muscles and imitating all those details and then trying to really get down to that level that, you know, we have we one can more imagine. slide. This is oh. our last slide, and so that looks like a close up of the hand of that same prosthetic arm. Yeah, as you can see, you know, those white things, those. We actually took the laser scan of human bones, the cadaver bones, to capture some of the details of bumps and grooves that we don't even understand why they're there. Because as long as we use cylindrical, robotic, metallic bones, we will never understand the meaning of those things. That might be extremely critical. Now, in this type of prosthetic arm, um, is it meant to ultimately be used on a person? If so, if you strapped it on someone, how would they control it? I understand that you're trying to figure out how to make it controlled directly by the person's brain. Mm -hmm. Right, so start from a relatively simple way to understand this, is that so the human brain has chemical reaction and it becomes electric signal that propagates to spinal cord down to the nerve. And then the, the electrical signal is that arrives at the muscle, the muscle contracts. That's sort of how the brain signal works. Now, the non-invasive way to control the prosthetic limb is to put a sensor on top of the, those muscles that are still there and then trying to capture that electrical signal that just arrived from the muscle, the, from the brain, mm -hmm. and then use that to amplify that signal and then to move the robot. So as you know, we could say, now think about moving your hand, you know, opening and closing without actually doing it. You're thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking about it. Okay, at that moment, now, you're, some muscles, the signals are starting to be sent to the muscles that really allow right. this to happen. And if you didn't, if, if I chopped off your arm, you still, have, if you, still, you still have some muscles left, and an electrical signal still would be arriving. Mm -hmm. We take those signals, then we make the prosthetic hand open and close. So how does that work? Because you have these nerve cells which carry an electric signal, and you have metal wires which can carry a signal. So do you actually attach the end of a nerve cell to the end of a metal wire? There are many ways to do it, actually. So their level of invasiveness, the non-invasive way is really on the skin, put a little sticker, and trying to capture the little bit of electric signal that's going on inside, amplify it, and then send that through the electric wire. That's a non-invasive way. But going all the way, you can actually have something on, the, on top of the, head, you know, the skin on the head, that's called EEG, or you know, peel the skin off, drill the hole, and then go into the, the sort of the surface of the brain, it's called ECOG, you can get more information. And then there are even electrodes that go right into the brain tissue and can measure that, that exactly what you're talking about in terms of the neurons and neural, you know, nerve signals. Because that and sounds we can capture highly, that. highly invasive though, to drill a hole in your brain. It, well, well, we're not drilling holes in the brain yet, but we're mm -hmm. drilling holes into the skull. Yeah. But it's actually not so invasive. So, so, how, so how far is this from being used? I mean, is it, uh, mm -hmm. is it in the stage where somebody could strap this on and actually move? Uh, yes. So actually, you know, how realistic is it is sort of, I'm going to twist it a little bit. So how realistic is it to have something like that in the brain? 
-hmm. It's actually realistic that it's FDA approved, you know, Parkinson's um, uh, surgical um, treatment includes implanting a chip in the brain. So this actually happens. It goes in and put a chip that can stimulate part of the brain and then come out, seal it off, and then and those people who have had a hard time moving can really start to move better. So it's not so far off from now, that point of view. And now, now, if you wanted to do a fairly complex task like pick up a ball with your hand and throw it, mm -hmm. uh, that involves complex actions with a lot of different muscles. Uh, is that one of the goals of this type of prosthetic arm, to be able to do complex motions like that? 